it's very hard work working with animals in any capacity. So you do just genuinely have to love doing it. Hello, reptile entrepreneurs. Welcome back to another episode. And today we are going to go and play on the artistic side. And we are talking to Zach Kerr, who is a highly uh, talented photographer and has combined photography and a love for reptiles. Zach, welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's good to be here. I appreciate you reaching out. Well, your photography is incredible. Uh, looking on Instagram, it's a treat every time your posts come across my feed. Uh, Thanks. Give us a little background as to how you became such a good photographer. Um, it's kind of an accident, really. So I never really had any interest in photography. I first got some poison dart frogs when I was in college about, well, nine, ten years ago. <laughs> so it's been okay. uh, a little bit of time. And I think a lot of animal keepers will relate when people ask you what pets you have, they expect you to say, oh, I've got a dog or I've got a cat. Mm -hmm. And when you say anything that's not those two things, there's a lot of questions and they instantly want to see photos yeah. and all of that. And when I first started keeping dart frogs, cell phone cameras were not great. So I decided to get like a pretty entry level DSLR and just start taking a few photos of what I had so I could show people easier and talk about it. Uh, and that's really what started it all off. I went to business school, uh, not art school, uh, but at one point I decided that I needed to get out of the business school for a moment and do something different. So I did take one photography class, uh, but that was really it. And the rest of it was just a lot of YouTubing, talking with other friends that were into photography. Uh, my cousin is a professional photographer, so he was a great mentor when I was first learning. Uh, but that's that's really how it all started, and it just sort of grew into what it is now over time from there. So this skill has all been developed within the span of 10 years, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just been a lot of trial and error and practice and a little bit of formal education, just getting the basics down for how a camera even works. But yeah, it's been, been a very long time and a lot of effort over the years. <laughs> well, that's actually inspiring to many of us who says, okay, it, it sounds like something that's achievable if we dedicate ourselves to it. And right. uh, so how did it evolve and grow from your dart frogs into what we see now? So I started making friends through the frog keeping hobby and I was posting a few pictures that I had taken on Facebook. Um, I didn't even really use Instagram when I first started taking pictures, but I was just posting it, sharing with friends. Everybody wants to see each other's animals. And Jared Ruffing, who owns Ruffing's Ranitamea, reached out and was like, hey, if you ever want to come take pictures of my frogs, like, I'd love to have you over. I had bought some frogs from him before, um, and about that time, I had started seeing Joel Sartore's work with National Geographic, so I was like, you know what, I could probably figure out a way to do that and focus a little bit more just on reptiles, because I don't have access to an orangutan or something like that, <laughs> like Joel uh -huh. does. Uh, so yeah, Jared just had me over one day, and from there, it was just oh, well, here's this other guy that uh, has a bunch of frogs and you can go over to his house like I could introduce you. Uh, and it really was just that first shoot with Jared that really kicked things off into proving that I could do something a little bit more polished. And then I just started meeting person after person who was like, yeah, you can come to my house if you want. And that's really all it was. And then over time, it's gotten to the point where I'm still shooting with people like Jared regularly, but it's much easier for me to show my Instagram sort of as a resume and say, Hey, can I come to your store or like your private zoo or things like that? Um, I've done some research labs as well. So over time, just growing that portfolio has really helped my ability to convince people that it's worth having me mm -hmm. over to their house. Yeah. Looking at your, well, 
the the what you show on Instagram that that's an amazing diversity of animals and the thought occurred to me how in the world does he find all of this yeah I get that a lot I think there are definitely a lot of people that think that I'm like traveling the world going out into the rainforest and finding these yes. animals but they are <laughs> all captive they're all people's pets and private collections uh, so it's uh, several hours in the car to get to where I want to go sometimes. And it's some pretty long days, but it's nothing crazy like flying to a new continent or something like that. Okay. They're just, they're all pets. Some pretty insane pets, uh, but they are all pets. And I'm, I'm pretty impressed that that many people will allow you into their private residence. That's pretty, pretty trusting. Yeah, especially, I mean some of the animals are quite rare and quite yeah. sensitive and like the venomous snakes are incredibly dangerous. So there's a lot of trust both ways, me and the person that owns and cares for the animals and knows how to handle them, but also their trust in me that I'm going to know how to handle myself when there's a huge cobra on the table in front of me or something like that. Uh, definitely. I, so let's get into the, the business idea of it. Uh, how do you monetize what you do? That's an interesting question. <laughs> so I think, so the whole interest in photography and all of that sort of came about, not necessarily an accident, but I wasn't, I didn't wake up one day and said, I'm going to be a reptile photographer. Mm -hmm. And I didn't wake up one day saying like, I'm going to start selling these photos. It was just probably Jared again, honestly, like, hey, could you print some of those out for me? Like, I want to hang them up in the house. And then other people seeing that or just the occasional Facebook message, hey, do you sell prints? Uh, do you sell like stickers, whatever it is? And I just sort of said like, yeah, I, I guess I could figure out how to do that. Um, so I didn't start out with the plan. It was just, okay, I guess there's interest for it. I'll figure it out. And over the years, it's been different iterations of just message me on Facebook here you can go to my website and then now recently I've shifted everything over to Etsy, but it's okay. all sort of just been whatever the next, uh, what feels like the natural step is where I've gone with it. And how big has it gotten as far as a business? Uh, would you, would you consider it just a, a hobby thing that you do? Has it graduated to a side business? Is it becoming a serious business? it's bigger than I thought it would be for taking pictures of frogs. <laughs> I think that's a, <laughs> it's a fair statement. I think, uh, the accountant that I use would also echo that he's always a little dumbfounded that he has a client that just takes pictures of frogs and snakes. Mm -hmm. Um, it's definitely a side business. It's not my full-time career. I work in marketing, so I have a full-time day job and all of that. And this is just really a robust passion project, but I do treat it like a business. Like you have to understand what your costs are in the equipment, the materials, what you need to track for tax purposes, what you can write off as an expense, um, inventory, uh, keeping track of Etsy fees, which are a huge topic of discussion right mm -hmm. now. So uh, you do have to really when you start making any kind of money from a hobby, you do have to start thinking about it seriously because if it gets to a point where you're like, okay, I need to talk to an accountant or I need to start putting this on my taxes, they're going to want all of the information from that year. So as soon as you start feeling like, okay, this is enough money that like somebody's going to notice somebody mm -hmm, being the government, mm -hmm. you got to start tracking yeah. that stuff. Even if you feel like it's still a small business, just, having records of everything and being smart about it as early as you catch that feeling is really important. Do you see the appreciation for reptile art photography growing? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's completely different than when I first really started getting into it. I think when I first started, like the reptile report was still doing their like, uh, photographer of the year type competitions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And the only people that were really doing serious studio work that I can recall at the time, um, 
Tyler Sladen was one doing a lot of studio work. Welsh morphology was another big one. And then I forget how to pronounce his name, but he's the reptiles for all guy on Facebook. Um, there, so there was just a pretty small pool of people doing like real serious polished studio photography. And now it's a very saturated market and that's not a good or a bad thing. It's just the reality of it. I think as technology has become more accessible and cameras have gotten better and cheaper, it's much mm-hmm. easier to get into it. And while there's like innate talent in taking photos, it's very easy to go get a camera and start taking studio photos. You just need okay. a yeah. camera, some lights and some black or white background. Well, say that there's somebody who has a passion for photography and is thinking about creating a business around photography in the reptile community. Mm-hmm. What kind of things would you say to them to get them started? First, I would check in with yourself and make sure that it's a genuine interest and not just something that you see an opportunity in. Um, I mean, there are definitely people that make probably more money than I do taking pictures, but from my perspective, I wouldn't see it as a full-time career just taking pictures. You're going to have to find a way to like monetize what you're doing through different products, like t-shirts, different offerings. You're going to have to be really present at reptile shows and you're going to have to do significantly more than just take photos. And that's going to take a lot of time and investment. So you got to make sure that at your core, you really just love doing it because if you don't love doing it and you just see it as like a quick opportunity, like this seems easy, I can do this. I'll just cash in. That's not what's going to happen. And I think, I think that's the most important thing to, uh, think through first. Okay. After that, like I mentioned, start tracking everything that you do. Every memory card that you buy, every trip that you take, track mileage, track expenses, track all mm-hmm. of that stuff mm-hmm. because the it really a, a valuable part of the business is like the expenses that you can write off because it costs a significant amount of money to do photography and really any art form seriously. So the more you can do to help yourself out with tracking those types of records uh, is going to help you out in the long run. Okay. Well, what is a day in the life of a photographer when you're doing your photography job? What does it look like? Uh, It depends on how far I have to drive. (laughs) So uh, I go to Michigan and Indianapolis a lot. And they're both of those trips are about four, four and a half hours one way. Wow. So a typical day to uh, Indianapolis, which is where I shoot with uh, Des and Steven with RepTech and Cold Blooded Cafe. Um, I'll wake up probably five five thirty in the morning. I've loaded the car in the garage uh, most of the way anyway. The night before wake up 5, 5.30, try and leave the house by 6, 6.30 so I can get there around 10, 10.30. And then shoot for several hours, try and eat lunch of some kind, shoot Mm -hmm. till probably about 6 or 7 at night, and then pack it all up and drive back home and hopefully make it home before midnight. Um, Wow. Sometimes I'll stay overnight where I'm at, but a lot of the times I'll just do one very long day with as much shooting as I can possibly fit into it. So that's a pretty good uh, amount of time and mm-hmm. expense to get this photography. Uh, at this point, how much goes into your decision as to what to shoot as in this is what you want to versus this is what you think you can get some money back from Uh, if you shoot that animal. So (laughs) you can sort of plan that stuff as much as you want, but animals are going to be animals at the end of the day. I mean, last time I went out to Indianapolis, it was weeks of, okay, what animals do you have? What are we going to shoot? What do we need to shoot? What are the interesting combinations of things that we could do? But then I think we got through maybe like a third of the list because sometimes Mm -hmm. a snake just won't sit still. And 
that's just how it goes and you can't do anything about it. So I think it's all just show up with a rough plan. I usually have a few shots in my head that I know I want to get for sure. And I'll spend more time to make sure I get those. But the rest of it is just sort of honestly just showing up and hoping for the best. I think usually when I shoot, unless it's like a specific contracted thing where like I need a photo of this for my website, my general approach is like, hey, I'm just going to show up and I'm going to do my thing. And whatever we get from that is what we get. Mm -hmm. And if people want to buy those prints, great. If they don't want to buy them, I've still got good photos to share with people and Again, back to that point that this is just something that I love doing. That's enough at the end of the day. Okay. And what does a mobile studio look like? A very packed car. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I typically, it's my studio lights because overhead lighting is not going to be enough. No matter how many LED strips you pull off of a tank cage, you're going to need a little bit more uh, power. Mm -hmm. Uh, Camera, obviously, depending on what type of animals I'm shooting, anywhere from like two to four different lenses. Uh, If I'm only working with really tiny Ranitomeia dart frogs, I'll just bring macro lenses because they're like half an inch long. So anything Mm -hmm. else besides a macro lens isn't really going to help me out. But if it's larger, like lizards or pythons or things like that, I'll bring a wider lens and some non-macro stuff. Um, And apart from that, a big roll of white paper, a big roll of black paper, some black felt, and some sheets of acrylic. Uh, There's objectively like not that much that I bring, but it's just about having the right tools for the right shot and I think a lot of that just comes with experience like when I first started shooting I would bring every piece of gear that I owned because Mm -hmm. I wasn't necessarily sure what I was going to need or why I was going to need it but after years of doing it I kind of know when I leave the house what I can leave at home and not stress about and the things that I for sure have to bring how do you get your subjects to stay still enough for a photograph Patience, a lot of patience. (laughs) I mean, Uh, I think it depends. Like frogs are a little bit more poseable because I can touch them and not die. Venomous snakes (laughs) are going to kind of do what they want to do. And you can sort of try and position them with a snake hook and do what you can to get them in the pose that you want. But you're kind of at their mercy for what they want to do. And then even some like smaller geckos, like, how bad do I want the shot versus how many times do I want to get bit by this gecko? And you just got (laughs) to weigh things out. And then also like you got to take into account the animal safety. So I think baseline doing animal photography does stress the animal a little bit. And you have to be aware of that because you're putting them in an unfamiliar situation. So you have to be quick with it. So there are a lot of times where after a few minutes, if I can tell that the animal is not calming down and it's just not going to happen, I'll just call it and say like, it's just not working today. We'll try something Mm -hmm. else. Um, But usually I can get a good shot or two within two to three minutes and then it's right back to their enclosure. Generally, it's tough for artists to make a living. Mm -hmm. Uh, What are the challenges that you've run into being an artist in the reptile community? I think, one, I consider myself very lucky that I don't do this full time because it would be extremely hard to make a living off of it. I think the biggest challenge is if you're not involved in the community initially from an animal perspective, you're going to have a really hard time knowing how to reach your audience with your artwork because you can be, you can draw a snake better than anybody else. But if you don't know anything about the animals and you can't have a conversation with the people that you're trying to sell the photo or painting or whatever to, it's probably not going to work. Because I think even on the animal side, like there are a lot of people that buy animals just because of who bred that animal or who Mm -hmm. raised it or like the people involved in it. And I think that's just as true for the artist. So it's not going to be enough to just be a good artist. You have to be 
involved with the community. You have to talk to people and you have to really understand what it is that you're working with. Um, I've seen a few artists that like are objectively very good artists and they can do really good work, but they just don't understand that you can't draw that snake with this scale over here because then it becomes a totally different species and it just doesn't look right. So there are just a lot of like fine details and things you have to understand that go well beyond just your artistic talent. And how much of your time that's allocated towards photography is actually spent marketing and uh, on social media? Uh, way more than actually taking pictures. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. I would bet that a lot of artists would relate to it. Like actually creating art is what you do the least. The majority of the time is trying to convince people that your art is good, posting it on Instagram, thinking of hashtags and captions, who you want to collaborate with next, fulfilling print orders, making sure that the first time you do a run of prints, the quality is where you expected it to be and getting into all of your like monitor calibration and all of those fine details. I think that far surpasses actually doing artwork. I mean, mm. I described like a typical day earlier and that's a 12 plus hour day and I haven't even like really seen the photos that I've taken yet. Like I look at them quickly on the back of the camera, but I'm not actually going through what I've got until usually the next day. So it's an entire day or two before you're even actually at the process of, okay, what art did I actually make and what am I going to do with it? So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's something that a lot of people might not understand. And if they do, I think any artist appreciates that they understand that. Well, what keeps you going? You've done this for a while and these, these photo shoots are grueling. And so something inspires you and keeps you going. Uh, what is that? It's really just the animals. Like I, okay. I think frogs will always be my favorite. And I get just as excited when I see a frog now as I did 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. it's, it's funny. Like I've realized a few times when I've been at Jared's house recently, like I photographed a frog this past year that was one of the very first frogs I ever photographed to his house because I was like, I swear I've seen this same pattern in one of my photos before. And sure enough, same frog nearly a decade apart. Wow. And so it's just yeah. that interest that I think, I mean, keeping animals being involved in that hobby is fun, but like nobody's going to tell you that it's like, sunshine and rainbows all the time and it's just like the greatest thing ever like it's very hard work mm -hmm. working with animals in any capacity so you do just genuinely have to love doing it and i think if you don't have that it'll just it'll fizzle out pretty quickly let's say we have an amateur photographer who is excited about uh, photographing reptiles and would like to try to make a make a go of it mm -hmm. as a business what kind of things should they watch out for? What are some of the, the pitfalls, roadblocks, and the things that would have been nice to know about uh, beforehand? I think you've really got to sit down and look at the cost and effort it takes to make a piece of artwork. So I think if you look at photos, but I mean, painting is another good example of this. It might cost whatever, four or five dollars to actually get the print made. But if you're not thinking of all of the time it took you and the money you spent to be able to print that photo, mm -hmm. that's where you're going to find yourself in trouble pretty quickly. I think a lot of people might underestimate how long it will take you to recover the costs of what it takes to make the artwork that you're making because you can't just uh, like make it and people just show up with money in their hands like that's not the end of it either you've got to spend a lot of time on social media building your online stores and presence and all of that takes a significant amount of time so you've got to make sure that you're pricing your work accordingly because it's very easy to order an entire run of prints and then realize that nobody actually wanted that one they want a different one <laughs> and if you'd asked first you would have realized that and now you're out a couple hundred dollars and many, many hours of work. 
So you've just really got to be intentional about like, okay, here's my end product that I want to give people. How much time did I invest into that? And there are times where you can cut yourself a loss for an opportunity. Like uh, one of my first like big things that happened was one of my photos getting used by National Geographic and I didn't get paid for that. But at the time I was like, I thought this would be the peak of a photographer's career is to have them use a photo. So I don't care if you mm -hmm. pay me or not, but sometimes you can't just give things out to free for free to anyone that asks. And you've got to be a little wary of that too, to just make sure you're protecting yourself. One of the most challenging things that an artist or a crafter runs into is figuring out how to place a value on their work. Mm -hmm. How would you suggest figuring out how, uh, how much to charge for a print? I think beyond costs, you also just have to be, I guess, confident in yourself and how you value yourself. I mean, I've sent, I get requests for like stock photo licenses, for example. Uh, I don't put any of my photos on deposit photos or stock photo websites like that. I think there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but it's just not the right business choice for me because you just get a couple pennies, maybe a dollar if you're lucky when someone uses your photo. And I personally value my work more than that. So I choose not to do that. And I'll have people request for stock photo type usage and I will tell them the price that I charge and they'll say, well, I can get a stock photo cheaper. And I tell them like, that's fine, but like, this is my work and this is what I charge and value for it. And you have to be comfortable standing your ground, whether that's $20 or $200, because there's always someone who would have been willing to pay more, but there are more people willing to pay less. And mm -hmm. you just have to figure out where you're comfortable and you have to stick with that. And what are the options for uh, making revenue off of photography? So you can charge for the shoot itself. Um, so someone can pay you to come out to do it. Uh, I typically don't do that. Um, I prefer like the... And some of this just honestly comes with the freedom that this is not my full-time career and I can make these decisions, but I prefer not to charge up front unless it's a very specific thing that the person wants for like, like I need this photo for my website or for this product. That's a little bit different, but for a general shoot, this is something that I love doing and I want to do and I will invest my own time and take a risk on myself in doing that in order to make up that money through print sales on the back end. So you can make it up front, you can do it afterwards with product, and then once you get into the product side of things, there's endless options. So I've done t-shirts, stickers, enamel pins with some other, like uh, Adeline Robinson, who's a great uh, artist, a painter, I guess <laughs> roughly you could call her, but her work is incredible, so I said, hey, can we take some of my photos, use your drawing skill that I don't have and make some pins? Uh, so we've done that. Um, let's see. <clears throat> stock photo licenses, again, like album art, uh, museum, stock photo displays, uh, things for zoos, things like that. So there are a lot of different ways that you can package your product. And it's all about just thinking of those ways that people use it. Like if you go to a reptile show, all of those people that have big, beautiful banners with photos on them, 99% of the time, they didn't take those photos unless they are the artist. They got them from somewhere. So how do you find out where they're getting those photos? How do you put your work there? How do you get in front of people that own businesses and might know other people that own businesses that would want to sell your photos in their store, sort of like a retail setting? There's really a limitless possibility for how you can rework a single piece of content into a different, like tangible product. And how do those stock websites work? It's very much like a passive income approach. You just upload your photo to the site. Usually 
in a couple different levels of resolution or the site will scale it for you. Like you just upload the maximum size you have mm -hmm. and they'll cut it down to smaller ones. And then some of them let you set price tiers, some of them don't, uh, but you sort of just upload your content and you get an email if you sell a photo. But usually like you'll see on deposit photos, for example, like the license for a full size image might cost the end customer a couple hundred dollars. You're going to make a very, very small fraction of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Adobe stock photos pays the least. I've got a friend that sells on that. And I think he, he would be thrilled if he made 25 cents off of an image sale. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of, again, why I tend to not go the stock photo route just because the income is so hit or miss. But I think the other thing that's important to consider really when you're making any product is how is that going to be used? If someone buys a stock photo with me from out with like, without talking to me, the next thing I know, one of my photos could be on like a PETA banner protesting yeah. keeping yeah. animals, which is clearly not what I'm about. So you have to also take that into consideration. Like, where is this going to end up? Can I control that? And if not, am I comfortable with that risk? So how does it work with a, a program like Canva where anybody can go on and make a, they're making banners and such, and they just pull mm -hmm. up photos from the stock a huge, uh, huge um, a collection of photos. How does the artist get credited for that? Uh, you don't. <laughs> so oh. usually with a stock photo license, you're like waiving all right to credit. So like the person doesn't have to say like, uh, this is a stock photo for my show banner and Zach took it. They can just use the photo without credit. So that's another thing where and it's it's very difficult with the internet because it's i mean i can go to google and pull any image of a snake right now and just take it into photoshop do whatever i want it's very difficult to maintain ownership and credit of that work so i think that's really i keep coming back to stock photos but that's another reason why i don't do it is because i value my work and i want people to know that i'm the one that did it and that's important to me yeah. And you give up a lot of that control when you license your photos out to other people. Um, by doing my own license agreements for the photos that I sell, I can specify how you can use that product, in what format, how many times you can use it. So for uh, album artwork, for example, it's a different price and different type of agreement if it's digital only versus print albums. Do you also want to put it on your t-shirts? Uh, because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people take for granted, like they'll buy a t-shirt with the album artwork on it. Cause they love the album artwork. The artist charges a separate fee for that. Like any different format that you use it, whether it's a t-shirt or you're going to put it on a billboard to promote it, or you want to run it in magazine ads, like all of those things are different opportunities that you can monetize your work that you quickly lose control over by just handing over the licensing part to a stock photo company. Okay. Now, how do you protect your work once it's on the internet? Uh, <laughs> you can and you can't. So uh, the first thing that comes to mind, I did an isopod poster where I photographed I had like a hundred and some isopods. I'm never doing that again. That was incredibly tedious and took so much time. <laughs> um, but you can go on like wish.com right now and you can buy a like 10 foot living room rug that allegedly has that poster on it. Now I know that I've never publicly posted a watermark free version of that photo. So what you're going to get is not what you think you're going to see like in that photo and there's like staged living room. But you you can't stop people from doing it there are generally ways to like report stolen content and do things like that mixed success uh wish.com specifically doesn't care i think facebook mm -hmm. and instagram also barely care and i think with just the overall nature of the internet if you're an artist and you put your work out there you have to be comfortable with it being reposted without credit 
printed and used on different things. And if you catch it, you can reach out to the people and do whatever you can to get mm-hmm. it taken down. But ultimately, it's it's just going to happen. There, you can't can't do anything to stop it. There's no watermark big enough or strong enough to, to prevent someone from doing it. And so <laughs> you kind of just have to make your peace with it. Yeah, I've noticed. Uh, even my photography, which is just iPhone photography, ends up in the strangest places. Oh yeah, and I uh, you know, just there's nothing you can do about it except just spend all your time chasing these things down on the internet. Yeah, and you'll you'll go insane doing that. I when I first started and first started to experience that, I put so much effort into it. But now when I see it, unless it's like like a huge company that started using my photo or something. I'm just like, yeah, well that's annoying, but whatever time to move on. Cause you like, I'm not going to get what I want in the end out of that situation. So you just got to move on. Is there any species that uh, is your goal that you haven't photog uh, that you haven't taken a picture yet of yet? <sighs> Yes. <laughs> I think the list is always changing. And I think another, I guess this is another point to your earlier question about like things you need to know getting into it is where the animals you're working with come from. So Borneo earless monitors would be pretty high on my list for things that I want to photograph. Finding a captive specimen that was legally imported and is not like an illegal animal is going to be next to impossible. So I put a fair amount of time and effort into knowing like, what am I about to photograph? Is that okay? How does that reflect on me as an artist? And some things you just have to pass on because of the statement that that inherently makes where I'm saying like, this is okay because I work with the animals you should too. So I think that's always something that comes up where there's always some new and cool animal but whether or not you can ethically get in front of it is a different decision point. Um, I'd put the, I forget the species name, but there's the spider tail viper. I think everyone's seen videos of where it's like hidden on the granite rock and it's tail moving, looks like a little spider crawling. That's probably top of the list. And then uh, Galapagos tortoises would probably be the other to round out that top three. Where do you plan on taking this photography business or hobby? Wherever it takes me. <laughs> Sometimes okay. I feel like I'm a little bit of a a passenger on my own journey, but mm-hmm. I think my approach has always just been keep doing it because I love it and opportunities will come up along the way as I continue to meet people and post different pieces of work. And if I stop loving it, then I'll stop doing it. But there's not really a specific end goal that I'm after. I think it'd be cool to put out a book eventually. But Oh, that'd be nice. It's also just so much work and money, and I just haven't built up the confidence to invest mm. <laughs> either of those things okay. yet. Um, but yeah, I, it's I'm always just scrolling Instagram and seeing a new keeper that I haven't encounter before like is in my state or near it or like last night I was scrolling and came across a uh, coral facility and I haven't done much work with different like pieces of coral and they're not far from me so that might be a person that I reach out to and it's just sort of again about always being in it and like living as a part of that overall community and not just trying to make the art separately and insert it. Like who are people I should be talking to or meeting? What's this person doing? Even just watching what other artists are doing and how they're approaching their reptile photography and artwork and what seems to be like new ways people are going. What are other people doing and seeing if those things interest me as well. Okay. Now our usual app, to uh, to show photography has been Instagram, mm-hmm. but they've gone off the deep end towards short form video. 
how yeah. does that affect your outreach? So when I first started really posting on Instagram, photos were fine. Like that's really all you needed and you just needed to be consistent for, I don't know, six or seven years. I posted at 7 a.m. and about 6.45 p.m. every single day of the week. And that got me to 60-some thousand followers. Mm -hmm. That's not it anymore. <laughs> like, I have photos that, like, I'll repost that were, like, my top posts of the year and reached hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of likes. And I'll post it now same time that I would have and I might get like 300 likes which is quite yeah. different and I think I I mean I've seen you post a lot about it as well everything is moving towards video and the reality is like I make reels and I post them I hate doing it it's like video is not how my brain works it's not my artistic interest like I love doing photography that's where the passion is and I will do the reels if I have to, to try and get the photos more exposure, but that's always where my focus is going to be. And it's become annoying that the app is shifting so much away from that. But at the same time, like they've got to compete with TikTok, who's taking a lot of their revenue away. So from a business standpoint, I get the decision, but from a creator standpoint, it feels like there's less and less opportunity lately for photos specifically. I mean, even Reddit, when you go to different subreddits, they all have their own very unique set of rules, what you can and can't post, which is really limiting. And there's just not a good way to throw a photo out on the internet and have it reach people as in the same way that it used to. How would you take the photography art form and turn it into a reel? Um, what I've started doing, uh, oh, so oh by the way, to... sorry, uh, for all those, uh, listening <laughs> reels are Instagram's short form video. So that, so what I'm asking is how do you turn a, uh, a photograph into a, say a 15, 30 second video? Sorry, Zach. Go no, ahead. that's a good thing to call out. So I really just take a photo that I like and I'm like, how can I make a video out of this and put music to it? Um, I posted something yesterday that was sort of just like a quick video of the process of like, Hey, I'm taking a macro photo of this feather. Here's a span, like panning shot of what the setup looked like. Mm -hmm. Here's a screen recording of me editing that photo. Here's the final photo. Um, some other things that have worked pretty well just with the resolution of the camera that I've shot I shoot with. I can zoom in pretty far without any like major loss of detail. So going from like a wide shot to zooming in and seeing the reflection of my hand in the frog's eyeball and some mm -hmm. silly song over it or whatever, just any way to rework that content. I think another big trend that I've seen that uh seems to work well as the people going like, this is what my camera sees. So there's like, I've got a friend Savannah who lives out in like uh, Jackson hole and does incredible wildlife photography and show regularly to like, here's a video of me walking to the camera trap and getting it. And here's what was on mm -hmm. the camera trap. But when I'm doing well, especially as of lately, maybe one shoot a month and I'm just getting all the photos I can in about eight hours video is not my top priority and it's not a constant well that I can pull from. So it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I will say that I love the behind the scenes videos and your, your video of cleaning up that the macro shot of that macaw feather. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. So uh, that is working. Uh, I, I do I understand so. <laughs> that it, it's kind of hard to figure out how to video something that's not supposed to be video right but uh you're at least uh doing a good job with what you're doing because i enjoy it thanks i think too it's worth pointing out that a lot of it is i've got a friend who is like a professional videographer 
So I'm texting him at like nine o'clock at night and I'm like, how do I make this just like zoom in smoothly instead of me <laughs> manually scrolling in and just like asking friends like straight up, like, how do I make reels? Because this is not my thing. I don't know what I'm doing. What are people looking for? Yeah, and I think that's something for budding photographers to realize is that you've lost your main uh, social media platform that was dedicated to photography. Uh, it's it, it's uh, cheating on you. With uh, mm -hmm. it wants to go out and hang out with TikTok. So <laughs> right, uh, and most a of those lot of videos us end up on Instagram anyway anymore. So <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> but a number of us who uh, tried to build up are built up our Instagram account on still photos are feeling a little bit jilted and left behind. Uh, for a photographer, it's it's even felt deeper. Yeah, and I think, um, too, like, that just helps give you that reality check, right? Like, why am I actually doing this? Like, I feel confident that if, like, Instagram was totally deleted tomorrow, I would still want to go out and take reptile photos. But there are like a lot of like major content creators, if Instagram and Facebook went away, they would be unemployed. And that's a very yeah. different approach to what I'm doing. And I think that's an important thing to keep in the back of your mind too. Like, okay, Instagram's working well right now. There's going to be something else. That something else is TikTok now. Do, is what you love doing, taking photos, or are you going to just abandon that and switch over to video just to keep gaining that popularity. And I think it's always about mm -hmm. just being confident with what you're interested in and what you love doing and keep pursuing those things no matter what and try and supplement it to help yourself out where you can, but don't give up on what your main passion is. You know, Zach, I would love it if in a month or so, TikTok announced their new feature, Galleries. And went right. ahead and just took <laughs> took Instagram's uh, heritage away. Yeah, I don't even <laughs> that would serve them right. I don't even have TikTok, and I just refuse to download it. But I would download it if they started doing still photos. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, is there anything else you would like to share with uh, reptile photographers out there? Uh, I think one. I appreciate everybody that's continued to support my work over the years it's uh <laughs> takes a lot of time and effort as i've uh laid out so i think that's uh the first thing to say but the second thing is like i answer questions about what i do all the time on instagram and people are always free to reach out like if you want to get into reptile photography if you want to talk about it if you want to send me photos that you took and ask me questions about like how do I get it to look like this or whatever? Like I'm always willing to talk about it. It's something that I love doing. So naturally I love talking about it. And I think that's really how, how this whole thing works. It's just like reptile keeping people learn how to breed a certain snake or whatever. And then they start talking to other people and it catches on and it's just all about growing and learning together. There are, I think maybe there are some like, secret techniques or whatever when it comes to art but with photography i could hand you my camera right now and you could take a picture of the same lizard that's right in front of us and the photos are going to look totally different because well, so i can much... guarantee you that <laughs> right well even like uh i mean i've shot like in the same room with some other like what I would call professional reptile photographers. Mm -hmm. We shot the same animal when we were sitting two feet apart from each other and our photos are wildly different because so much of that just comes from what you as the artist see and how you choose mm -hmm. to edit that photo and process it after you've taken it. So there's no real reason for me to not tell you a camera setting or whatever, because mm -hmm. even if I tell you exactly how I took the photo, yours will inherently look different and there doesn't need to be like any concern of like competition around that. Zach, if someone wants to see your work, where's the best place to see your work and contact you? Uh, despite everything, it is still Instagram. Uh, <laughs> it's really where I post everything. Uh, my Instagram is I am making art. Uh, 
all as one word, you will know you're in the right place when you get there. Uh, you can also just search my name, Zach Her, and it should show up with, I think my profile photo is a gecko right now, but that's the main place I link off to Facebook and some other like little things from there, but Instagram is really where I'm most active and where I'll see messages and comments and all that stuff. Zach, I want to thank you very much for coming on and sharing your experiences with uh, the reptile entrepreneur community. Yeah, of course. It was a great time. It was good talking with you.